Hi guys, it is another snowy, frosty midwinter night here in mid-November here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on, it is a Friday night, November 18th, 2022, and I have just pulled out of my uh, winter time clothing my, these flannel lined blue jeans. Say if I got my flannel lined blue jeans over my wool socks inside my uh, my booties that my sister gave me here to survive the bitter winter of mid-November 2022 in New York baby. But I could be in Buffalo, New York. Good God. But it, since it is a Friday you know what that means. It is a Friday, so it is time for my ecological meltdown roundup rant, where I uh, head over to mongabay.com for their weekly, what is it, the cavalcade of catastrophe unfolding on this collapsing planet. Check in with Rhett Butler and the boys and girls. I'm not sure the lighting. I'm going to Bring a, we'll put this little dog to bed and uh, see if we can get a little more light on the subject here. Oh man, these flannel lined blue jeans. There's some more light on the flannel lined blue jeans. So let's go see what's going on and how we can feel guilty about taking down a planet with our consumer and lifestyle choices. <clears throat> the number one story on Manga Bay this week, the number one story, blue jeans, an iconic fashion item that is costing the planet dearly, but they sure are keeping me warm. The production of blue jeans, one of the most popular apparel items ever, has for decades left behind a trail of heavy consumption, dis diminishing Earth's water and energy resources, causing pollution and contributing to climate change. The harm done by the fashion industry has intensified, not diminished in recent years. The making of blue jeans is water intensive Yet much of the world's cotton crop is grown in semi-arid regions requiring irrigation and pesticide use. As climate change intensifies irrigation dependent cotton cultivation and ecological catastrophe are on a collision course with the Aral Sea's ecological death a prime example and warning with some major fashion company while some major fashion companies have made sustainability pledges yes the industry has yet to make significant strides towards sustainability with organic cotton for example still only 1% of the business Yes, there you go. So here's how my blue jeans are destroying the planet. I remember down there in Ecuador uh, going along and seeing this blue waterfall. I mean, the entire waterfall was navy blue and uh, found out very quickly what it was, was where this blue jean factory down there in, in Ecuador was just dumping the dye into the, uh, you know, just into the river. But it sure was a pretty navy blue waterfall. Yes. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, you know, this is uh, Manga Bay's check-in with these little short stories from Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. All right, a few bullets, short little bulletins from Sub-Saharan Africa this year, this week. All right, a rule change by the Forest Stewardship Council. The Forest Stewardship Council means companies like Havea Sudcom, which cleared nearly 148,000 acres of rainforest in Cameroon since 2011, are now eligible for the world's leading sustainability certification. So if you want to get certified as a sustainable, you know, by as a sustainable deforester by the Forest Stewardship Council, what you do is you take your corporation over to Cameroon in Sub-Saharan Africa, you bulldoze and obliterate off the face of the planet 150 thousand acres of rainforest and you will be rewarded with a forest stewardship council seal of approval. Okay, what's going on in the Congo Basin a little bit to the east? Two years after announcing an imminent ban on exports of raw timber, governments in the Congo Basin have yet again delayed its implementation, this time indefinitely, citing the need for more time <laughs> to prepare for it. Yeah, like when there's no raw timber left to export. Then I, th that is one way to get a ban on exports of raw timber. Just export every single bit of raw timber in the Congo Basin. Either export it uh, or cut it down and use it for charcoal, uh, one or the other. And then uh, you will have an export ban on raw timber from the Congo Basin when there is no more Congo Basin rainforest. And that is exactly when you are going to stop exports from the Congo Basin. As long as there is one tree left in the Congo Basin, you know, for the next few years, as long as there is one tree standing, there will be no export ban of timber from the Congo rain. You can kiss the Congo rainforest goodbye. Uh, Anyway, from Sub-Saharan Africa, I guess, to wherever sharks live. No requiem for sharks just yet. Yes. Uh, a recent study found that more than a third of sharks raised are threatened with extinction, making sharks the second most threatened vertebrate group after amphibians. So we will see if the UN will save the sharks next month. Okay. Should more wildlife trade be legal and regulated? There you go. Uh, <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, allowing for legal, for legal regulated wildlife trade could be better than banning it altogether from any species. Yes, some scientists say referring to successful case studies where local communities were involved in sustainable 
wildlife trade. But some conservationists are worried that changing the way you know it's now set up will be bad news for endangered wildlife and point out it has been a significant factor in the survival of species such as elephants and tigers. Oh boy, so uh, Magabe, you know, they have their YouTube channel, so this week, I haven't tuned into it yet, their YouTube video this week is on all of these new animal crossings that you're seeing more and more of the underpasses and overpasses trying to keep animals from getting hit by cars. You know, who can argue with that, I guess. Um, all right, you will not believe this. We're going to go down to Chile. In Chile, drought and human expansion threaten a unique national park. This is La Campania National Park in Chile. It's home to threatened species of animals and plants, many found nowhere else. Yes, but the region has been suffering from a 12-year drought, and the park also faces pressure from expanding farmland and urbanization. Yes. Oh, uh, do you think so? Uh, more stories on the impacts of palm oil. In six Latin American countries, so I won't take the time to list here, between 2010 and 2021, at least 298 cases were opened against 170 companies and individuals involved in the palm oil industry. Do you think so? Uh, good Lord. Do you believe that a Sulawesi nickel plant coats homes in toxic dust? Yes. Uh, anyway, do you think so? Uh, here is an update on what's going on in Myanmar uh, since that military coup in 2021. Uh, since, since the coup, community level efforts to safeguard M Myanmar's vast tracts of forest from de development are buckling under the pressure of rampant resource extraction. Yes. Uh, environmental defenders and indigenous rights activists are being targeted for arrest and detention by military-backed groups. Uh, do you think so? Okay, here's a weird one. I might have to come back and make this my Sunday Doomsday Sermon. Uh, this is just the little encapsulation. What do you guys think? Uh, does this sound weird enough for a Doomsday Sermon? Whether humans can survive climate change is the wrong question. <laughs> There you go. Who wants to talk about whether or not humans can survive climate change? That's just the wrong question. As delegates debate at the dog and pony show this week, we should be looking ahead with more interest to next month's COP15 on the Convention on Biological Diversity the treaty aimed at saving the planet's wild species. The debate 
over whether humans can physically survive climate change is misguided, a new op-ed argues. Rather, you know, in asking whether humans can physically survive or go extinct is, is the other option, I guess. The question sh we should be asking is how to save the endlessly complex and ailing biosphere. Uh, I agree 100%. Uh, quoting whoever there, John Reed, whoever John Reed is, quote, the reward will be a future in which people are still living in and on this splendid planet, rather than asking with increasing trepidation whether we will manage to defend ourselves from it. Close quote. Maybe we'll come back and revisit that. Okay, I love it when they ask a question. So this question, this is coming out of sub-Saharan Africa, you know, from the Congolese rainforest which is becoming more and more a center for chocolate pro cocoa production. The question being, can a luxury chocolate company save a Congolese forest? Hmm. The answer to the question, can a luxury chocolate company save a Congolese forest is no. A luxury chocolate company cannot save a Congolese forest. All right, well that was easy. Uh, it's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's a killing field at Brazil's airports. More than 2,000 wildlife strikes with aircraft are reported in Brazil every year, but those numbers are underreported. And the vast majority of the animals, imagine that being hit at an airport, are birds. Yes. Uh, who would have thunk it? Okay, what is going on with uh, hydropower plants in the Chilean Andes? Yes, that are home to indigenous people with a spiritual connection to rivers and the surrounding mountains. Uh, what do you think? is, uh, uh, I can't imagine. Anyway, I think we all know the answer to that. Uh, so they have two of these stories right next to that. Dam construction ignites indigenous youth movement in southern Chile. Dam construction on the Bio Bio watershed has plagued indigenous communities in South Central Chile for decades, with many families having to relocate due to flooding of ancestral lands. Uh, the 90 megawatt Rucalwe hydropower plant is just the latest project causing controversy among local communities who say they are sick of battling infrastructure projects that disrespect their culture and traditions. Yes. Uh, hydropower plants require the clearing of trees and the disruption of river flows, which can have a significant impact on surrounding ecosystems. Do you think so? Gee, so what do you think 
is going on with a new airport in El Salvador. Critics cite threats to communities and mangroves from El Salvador airport plans. The airport of the Pacific threatens to destroy mangroves and relocate local farming and fishing communities in a rural part of El Salvador. Uh, the project is part of a plan to develop the harder to reach eastern regions of the country through more infrastructure projects. Yes. The mangroves, which are getting ready to get bulldozed, are important for preventing flooding and erosion and serve as breeding sites for fish and crustaceans. And it makes me wonder how long it's going to be before this airport is underwater. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, all right. Uh, here is some weird little backroom deal going on in Guatemala too complicated to get into. <clears throat> All right, what is going on with electric vehicles in Indonesia? Indonesia's grand EV plans hinge on a green industrial park that likely is not green. Indonesian President Joko Widodo is courting investment for a, quote, green industrial park, a key component in his ambitions to boost Indonesia's economy by making the country a global hub for the production of electric vehicles. Indonesia holds the world's largest reserves of nickel, a key component in EV batteries. Yes, however, experts have raised concerns about the environmental impacts of nickel mining and industrial development, which can negate any environmental benefits of electric vehicles. Hmm. Uh, more hopium. Uh, did you know? Uh, you know, the average ranger works ninety hours a week. Ninety hours a week. I don't believe it for a minute. Anyway, uh, all right, as long as we're over there in Indonesia talking about electric cars, Indonesia adds sustainability to its timber legality system. Yes, the Indonesian government is rebranding its timber legality system to include timber sustainability uh -huh, in anticipation of an upcoming deforestation-free regulation by the European Union. Uh, we talked about this uh, last week. Uh, so now, not only are the illegal logging, is it, it's not only legal, but it's legal and sustainable. There you go. Problem solved. Okay, well, let's all wish uh, Lula luck in saving the planet 
you will not be surprised to hear in the final days before Bozo Nero's defeat, deforestation boomed in Brazil. According to data published today by Brazil's own government, deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon amounted to 904 square kilometers in October, a 3% increase over last year. Year to date, uh, we're looking at 20% more deforestation than last year. Uh, there you go. Deforestation hit a 15-year high in 2021, and of course that's going to be broken in 2022. We will see if Lula is going to save the planet in 2023. Uh, okay, we have another question. Will high-tech foods save nature? Oh, uh, the, before I get into the story, the, the answer to the question, will high-tech foods save nature? is no, high-tech foods will not save nature. But I guess this is my old uh, buddy George Monbio, as, is it Monbio or Monbiot, has made it into Monga Bay. Yes, uh, soaring industrial livestock production is dramatically increasing greenhouse gas emissions deforestation, and biodiversity loss. Current meat production methods are unsustainable and fast pushing the natural world and the global food system to the edge of collapse, argues British environmentalist George Monbio. Yes. Uh, he is cheerleading Rapid high tech fixes. Yes. He is. George Mambio is cheerleading revolutionary technology that can produce meat and cheese from the air. There you go. There you go. The revolutionary technology can produce meat and cheese from the air. That reportedly tastes just as good as the real thing. All right, we're going to have some air meat, air burgers. I'm going to have an air cheeseburger. Yes. Critical voices fear this not yet widely tested techno fix may be a magic bullet that does not work in the real world. Yes, do you think so? <laughs> I guess when we suck that carbon out of the air, we can make cheeseburgers out of that carbon we're sucking out of the air. Anyway, okay. Uh, no, we're not going. I'm, I'm very proud of Rhett for barely mentioning uh, the dog and pony show. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll talk about that. What's going on in... Bolivia. Bolivian protected areas hit hard by forest fires. Nearly 9,000 square kilometers, otherwise known as 3,500 square miles, have been burned, had been burned across Bolivia by mid September. Uh, Tucabaca Valley 
Municipal Wildlife in Otuquis National Park are most affected. Uh, there you go. In addition to the habitat loss for the region's wildlife, smoke from the fires reportedly has resulted in vision and respiratory problems for residents of nearby communities. But anyway, guys, I understand I'm talking to myself, so we're going to end up in Haiti. What better way to uh, wrap up a, <laughs> a chronicle of the collapse than in Haiti? Amid conflict and chaos, a reforestation project surges ahead in Haiti. An important reforestation project is forging ahead in Haiti, despite the nation's economic and political upheavals. All right, they are reforesting 50 hectares, otherwise known as about 125 acres, with native plants this year in Grand Bois National Park. Yes. On an island buffeted by government woes, severe deforestation, and climate change, reforestation can save lives by mitigating the impacts of extreme rain events, droughts, and hurricanes, and even reduce the risk of landslides caused by earthquakes. Yep, until uh, these native trees get about this tall, and then they'll get turned into charcoal. But anyway, I've got to wrap up uh, this week's edition of my ecological meltdown roundup rant and uh, take my flannel lined blue jeans and go uh, freshen my drink while I still can. Bye guys.